Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Pramod Kenayar. I teach at the Department of English at the University of Hyderabad. In this lesson, we will be looking at a module that deals with media and popular culture. The first crucial point to be kept in mind is that the media does not only deliver content. That a film, a magazine, a tourist brochure, a comic or even something as large as a museum is not just media but a medium. It conducts, it acts as a conduit for information but it also transforms the information, packages the information in certain ways. That is, we cannot think of the medium as a neutral set of pipes or processes through which content is delivered. The content is structured around the medium, the medium determines what kind of content gets delivered. The second aspect to be kept in mind is me, the media and I am using the term to include both traditional ones like print and the new ones like the digital. The medium is a central component of popular culture. It determines the way we see ourselves as a public. It determines our actions, our behavior and our responses. Therefore, the meaning that is produced in and through the media, in and through the choice of medium, whether it's print or film, is actually something that constructs us as a person, as a social order, a community, or even a nation. It organizes the audience, the perception of needs, the perception of threats, of friendliness, and therefore, the medium is something that is crucially a popular component. It determines the shape of our social life, our sense of ourselves as a public, our sense of ourselves as a nation. What is the significance of media for any popular culture course or a culture studies course? Culture studies, as you know, focuses on everyday life, on the meanings we understand, produce, the belief systems we carry, the behavioral attitudes. Where do these come from? People produce it, yes, and we receive them, yes. But what people produce is transmitted through a whole network, which is what we are referring to as a media. The sharing of information is not just the sharing of data. The sharing of information is the sharing of a system of shared beliefs, of ideas. We understand ourselves to be a nation because we share beliefs. What shapes that system of beliefs? What helps us? forge a common sense of the past, the present and the future, what gives us shared aspirations is the media. And therefore, we cannot think of the medium as just something that delivers. It determines who we are in a certain way. Popular culture, as you know, is determined by, characterized by both depth and breadth. But there is always the possibility of something new entering the system. There is always something radical that is possible within the popular cultural system. What the Marxist media theorists have argued for a very long time is, popular culture is not really the culture of the masses or the popular common person because the media is controlled by dominant social groups. Because what is represented, the content delivered, only reinforces social distinctions. It retains the class binaries, it retains the racial distinctions and it retains the patriarchal setup. In other words, when we say that popular culture is something that has its own media presence and the media caters to them, what we tend to forget is the medium determines how they see themselves. And for the Marxist critic, this way of seeing themselves is organized in particular ways so that the class system, the power structures are retained. There are four very well-known models by Dennis McQuail of the media. The first is the liberal pluralist or the market model which argues that everything in media from form to content, the delivery processes is driven by market needs. It simply means it's a media industry devoted to the generation of profits more than anything else. Then there is the public interest model 
What do we mean by a public interest model? It means that the medium has a certain amount of responsibility. Periodically, for instance, when you look at newspapers, there will be debates about um, media ethics. Media ethics comes from this public responsibility model which says the media have a responsibility to maintaining peace, law and order. It has a responsibility to be not discriminatory. It has a responsibility to make sure that the sense of national belonging is retained. The public interest model is an important one because practically every form of media from print in the 15th century when it first arrives on the scene to WhatsApp and the digital cultural media of the present time have all been subject to this scrutiny. Uh, periodically, if you read the newspaper, there will be the Press Trust of India and others who propose that the media has overstepped its limits, that the media has not been responsible in reporting. Um, during wartime, for instance, the role of the media becomes crucial because do we report the death of our soul, the deaths of several of our soldiers, um, or is it detrimental to the interests of the nation? The public interest model therefore proposes that the media should not be just profit driven, but must be geared towards a certain amount of social responsibility. Uh, this is something that we see very often even now. The professional model where specific roles have been professionalized. This involves questions of expertise, the knowledge economy where certain service sectors become dominant. Uh, Finance is a uh, key case in point now. The final model is the alternative media model, which also, if you uh, look at newspapers today, has acquired considerable attention. Let me give you an example why uh, the attention to alternative media is very important. Several of you would have heard of something called embedded journalism. Embedded journalism, which makes its appearance in the early 90s, is when the journalist is embedded in a particular war effort, for example, and reports on the war or reports from the corporate office. This means basically the person who is reporting is part of the system which controls whatever is going on. And increasingly the debate is that embedded journalism cannot be trusted, that it serves the interests of the army invading, for instance, and therefore the reportage is biased and one-sided. How do we verify what's going on on television or in the newspapers? I read a certain news item and I am impressed by it or I am inspired by it, but effectively I trust it. The alternative media model suggests that because all media is corporatized, you do not really get the accurate picture because the corporate controls the meaning, the government controls the meaning, profits control meaning. The alternative media model pays more attention to independent media or indie media as it's uh, sometimes abbreviated as that says the verifiability of facts, the verifiability of processes will help us determine what's wrong with the established or more popular media. Uh, this is a huge, uh, shall we say, campaign or move to decorporatize media. This involves independent filmmakers, independent news reporters, uh, comic artists like Joe Sacco and all of them who are trying to give us a different picture of what's going on. My example uh, I mentioned, Joe Sacco, comes from one of the more popular systems of media today. It's in print but also in the digital form and uh, if you know print includes newspapers, periodicals, books and other things. But increasingly those are all digitized. The important thing to note here is that for cultural studies, the alternate media model is a crucial one because it tells us that the agency of the people is not entirely lost. This is something to be kept in mind that alternate forms of reportage like Joe Sacco's are crucial. Now, Joe Sacco's work in Bosnia, um, in Eastern Europe and in Palestine, all report the contrary conflictual nature of whatever is going on, the war effort, for instance. So the United States media gives us one picture of the war, Joe Sacco gives us something else. Why is this important? It's important because cultural studies focuses on power. We are talking here about the power of state-run or corporatized media 
to determine what kind of meaning we obtain about say the war what kind of picture emerges about the war um, let's move the focus slightly to popular cinema cinema culture is not only about films it's about the posters the marketing the interviews of stars the coverage in periodicals about the lifestyles of stars the frequently acrimonious debates over censorship the audience reception and the merchandising the related domains of modeling and the fashion industry why do we pay attention to cinema as a medium ever since cinema appears on the scene it's in india itself over 100 years old now is because it reaches a range of audience that perhaps no other medium has reached till the arrival of the internet and television for a very long time cinema was the only really popular medium now studies have demonstrated that the idea of a nation the idea of nehruvian socialism the idea of patriotism circulated through the 60s and 70s because of the hindi cinema's power and reach to go back to the point i made about alternative media increasingly multiplex cinema and other kinds of cinema offer us other ways of looking at the nation other ways of looking at say communal violence or uh, violence against women the recent debates over the documentary would be a case in point all of these seem to suggest that the medium is crucial in the shaping of perceptions what do i mean by this whether it is a film or a book or a soap opera what is being given to us is not just simply meaning it gives us a frame of interpreting the world it's the organization of our perceptions about what we are seeing which is why i gave you the instance that cinema shaped the sense of a nation through the 60s and 70s this is of course the pre television era in india what's important here is to understand that in the process of nation building 10 to 20 years after independence um the british had left india needed a sense of itself india needed a sense of its destiny india needed a sense of its problems in the past and in the present film provided that particular dimension it gave us a sense of ourselves it gave us a sense of ourselves to ourselves in the new media with all the digital cultural practices that you see today we see similar efforts being made campaigns signature campaigns petitions online protests are all part of what popular culture can be some of you would have heard of the arab spring the tehri square protests these were for various reasons called facebook revolutions i do not know whether you are aware of the term but they were called facebook revolutions because of one key factor the campaign against the dictatorship the campaign for democracy was not run by political leaders it was run by ordinary people it was run by the common person entirely independent of both the state and the corporate it was done via the digital medium surely yes uh, one has to accept that facebook is a commercial project and it makes money for its founders and and the and the company and so on and so forth through various means so we cannot really detach the capitalist angle to this but what is important and what i'm emphasizing is political campaigns were run entirely through voluntary effort this means basically that no state government was able to regulate what was going on which is partly the reason why it's called a facebook revolution because unless facebook shut down you couldn't shut down the campaign so the egypt uh, tehrir square campaign was called uh, i like arab spring was called facebook revolution because of the power of the medium to bring people together how does one read media alongside popular culture the first real concept that we need to be aware of is something called media literacy our traditional idea of literacy is that of being literate in the ability to read and write but media literacy is an awareness of not just the form in which it is delivered but the content it asks us to examine the tools of persuasion being used bias and reporting 
the way in which certain characters are portrayed, stereotypes, hidden racist, patriarchal, sexual or casteist subtexts that go on. We need to ask who creates the images? We need to ask what are these images doing? How do they come together? Is there any politics that you can discern them? We will use a couple of examples in order to see what we mean by media literacy. The first popular medium is comics. Children grow up on it, adults read it. There are various kinds of comics from the mythological to the science fiction, from the fantasy genre to the alternative comics mode. There is travel writing in the form of comics. There is, there are accounts of trauma, including cancer, um, in the form of comics. There are purely fictional stories. There are autobiographies in comics as well. How does one read comics? Why should we read comics at all? Comics are a popular domain. It's a popular medium. The panels are movements in space. The space between the panels, they are called gutters, shows the transition of time. Um, the question we have to ask is, what kind of visual is given to us? How are the characters portrayed? Are there common men, superheroes, monsters, children? Um, are the heroes independent, wealthy people or are the heroes altruistic, generous and heroic? What are the symbolisms used? What kind of visual language is being developed to talk about say race or caste or class? How are men and women represented? Are the comics political? I will give you two examples to demonstrate the necessity of reading the political in comics. The first one comes from Art Spiegelman's Mouse. Mouse is a Pulitzer Prize winning comic book which was the first major attempt to talk about the Holocaust that is Nazi Germany's extermination of the Jews in comic book form. It is perhaps the most celebrated comic book in world history. What it did was to portray the Jews as mice and the cats would be the Nazis. So it was a cat and mouse game and cats hunt mouse. The mice become victims. It's a study of Auschwitz. It's a story of Spiegelman's father. The second one is a comic book which appears in 2011 from an Indian publishing house. It's called Bhimayana. Bhimayana is a retelling of the autobiographical notes of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. What the text does is to take the autobiography of Ambedkar, um, it's a 60 page autobiographical notes that he wrote and it's in fragments and convert it into a comic book which has been illustrated by Gond artists. Now what is interesting about this is also that at every stage in the comic book in Mouse and in Bhimayana, you see symbols that tell us about race, caste, gender, oppression, state and the law. What's happening here? What's happening is very simple. What we take to be a very ordinary, very routine comic book, which by definition means something funny, is actually delivering serious content. It's asking us to pay attention to questions of genocide, of casteism, of oppression, of discrimination. And therefore, the questions that come up are about ethics, about how races have always lived, how the caste system has survived and so on and so forth. What we take as a very routine, very ordinary genre actually therefore has extraordinary political significance. This is the reason why what we think of as innocent comics are not innocent at all. I now want to move on to what is referred to as cabinet culture. Cabinet culture is the culture of the museum because things are put in cabinets and boxes and showcases. There are four elements of any museum. The first is the object. The second is the way the object has been presented um, in a box, on the wall, or, you know, frame and so on and so forth. The public it is seeking to target and the audience reception of whatever is here on the table or on the wall. 
do you think museums are just random collections of objects? They are not. Suppose we were to say that a museum of history puts together four elements on a table, then it follows from that that those four elements have been put together in order to produce a certain kind of meaning. For example, one object which is a gun suggests to us something about violence or war. But a gun situated in a particular set of contexts can also mean protection, defense, national pride, violence or anything you want. The cabinet, the museum frames the objects in particular ways. It seeks to tell a story through material objects. Remember the material objects themselves don't tell us the stories. It is a connection between them that tells the stories. The simple example would be the Lee Enfield rifle of 1857. Why was the rifle a controversy? Because the cartridges used supposedly from made from the grease of uh, pigs and cows were unacceptable to both the Hindu and the Muslim soldier in the British army. Now think about this. There is a gun, there is a cartridge, there is a rebellion. What is the connection between the three? Two are objects. One is a process. You see the connection between these that the museum forges is what we call history. The objects themselves do not tell the story. It's the arrangement of the objects that tell us a story. The narrative, the language or the grammar of the objects tells us a story. In and of themselves, the objects don't do anything. They are just there. Here is a gun. Here is a cartridge. Um, but what is the connection between the cartridge, the gun and the rebellion? Oh, well, the cartridge was used in the gun. This cartridge was objected to by the people and they rebelled. So you see, the museum has its own language. The museum has its own narrative. How these things are put together is what constitutes the culture of the museum. My final example for media and popular stud culture and cultural studies is brochure culture. Every product that you buy is accompanied by a brochure, but I'm not looking at that one. I'm talking here about tourist brochures. What does a tourist brochure do? Suppose you want to go to any particular place about which you know very little. You go down to the tourist office, you get a brochure, you write to the company, they send you a whole bunch of flyers and notices and so on and so forth. It contains various kinds of information. But is it all there is? Is it only data? The task is to look at the representation of the place in that particular brochure. What is being offered? What is implicit and explicit in the brochure? Tourist brochures commodify places. They convert places into purchasable experiences. They tell us that if you go to this place, this is what you will enjoy. The best example of such commodification processes would be Disneyland. Why does anybody want to go to Disneyland? Why does everybody want to go to Disneyland? It is not Disneyland itself, but the way it gets represented that tells us the idea that persuades us that this is the place to go. It converts a landscape into an attraction. It converts the games there into something that adds to our value, our sense of ourselves. Is there anything implicit in what's going on? For example, tourist places that showcase native or aboriginal cultures. They present natives in certain ways. Those natives are separated from their everyday lives and put here as museum objects, as objects you see, objects you photograph, objects that you talk about later and all that. But the difference here is the minute you take them out of their context and put them into this particular museum or tourist resort or whatever you want to call it, they have been commodified because their experiences are no longer the experiences of their local place. We see them not in their local place or even if there is tourism that is structured around local places, they have been converted into objects of scrutiny. They are not subjects, they are objects. They are objects that you can buy, you can photograph, you can write about, you can put a post on Facebook about this. 
as you can see the range that we have covered today from cinema through comics through museums to tourism are not in the traditional sense media for the reason that we think of media as only print i have been proposing that all forms of popular culture that i have discussed are also media because they mediate between us and whatever we are seeing the last example i gave you about aboriginal cultures or native cultures aboriginal cultures are not available to us in pure form they are not right there in their original habitats they are mediated for us through the brochure if you go to this place you will see the native americans the brochure says this what does that mean you go to the andamans you go through this particular highway you see the jarawa tribes what does it mean it means very simply that our perception of them has already been organized when we meet them we are already influenced by what we have read about them what we have seen of them in other words the medium the brochure has already determined our responses we have been constructed as audiences just as these people have been constructed as objects to be consumed that is the object to be consumed we are the consumers this relationship has been established not naturally but because of the media for cultural studies the process of representation is crucial as we know it therefore means very simply that how the representation occurs in the medium the form and the content determines social relations how i look at the aboriginal depends on what i have been told about the aboriginal how i look at the jarawa depends on what i perceive the jarawa to be because of the medium so the medium should not be seen as an innocent conduit of information the medium is what determines social relations for us working in cultural studies it's important to recognize that these are politically charged acts these are not ordinary because they determine social relations they are about power thank you